We've been in a book study on Thessalonians, first book, and we have worked our way into the fifth chapter, into verses 12 through 28. And what is interesting about this passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28, is Paul closes with 18 commands, the imperative mood in the Greek, 18 present imperatives. That's a whole lot of commands being issued in verses 12 through 28. That's a whole lot. And all of them are present imperative, second person plural, with the exception of the last one. All the first 17 are present active imperatives or present, either present active or middle imperative, second person plural, with the exception of the last one in verse 26, it's an aorist imperative. And so this is quite an interesting uh, passage where in concluding the book, he issues a lot of commands uh, to the congregation, both pat to the pastor and the congregation. So what we're looking at today is, is we're going to, we've, we have already exegeted and studied. I, I want to begin with verse, we'll, we'll, I'll look at 12, but I'm, I'm, my exercise cuts from 13 through 15. Let me start with 12. We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligent labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instructions that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Verses 12 to 13, notice there's a period in the middle of that verse. 13, so we call that 12, 13a. And it, that whole instructions there is given to the congregation about the pastor and to the pastor about his work with the church. In, in the beginning there, in, in the 13th verse, what I call B, because it's a new sentence, he says, live in peace with one another. And that's the first imperative. Live in peace is one Greek word. Live in peace is one Greek word. That's a verb. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. Then he says, we, we urge you, brethren, admonish. That's an imperative. Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. The word encouraged is also a present imperative. Help the weak, the word help is a present imperative. Be patient with everybody, that is also a present imperative. See, that's a present imperative. See that no one repays another with evil with evil, but always seek. Seek is another present imperative after that which is good for one another and for all people. We're going to stop here and we're going to do a mini-series as Paul introduces the, his final string of commands to the congregation about things they need to do to improve congregational relationships. And the theme of verses 13 through 15 is live in peace with one another. And then he tells you, after he uses that theme, live in peace with another, then he tells you, I want you to admonish the unruly, I want you to encourage the faint-hearted. I want you to help the weak. I want you to be patient with all men. I want you to see that no one pays evil with evil. I want you to seek after that which is good for one another. Okay? And so we're going to stop here for a little bit, and we're going to look at the dynamics of what he just said. We're going to look at the dynamics over the next few weeks. What does he mean by admonish, and what does he mean by encourage and help and be patient and see and seek. So we're going to stop and we're going to do a little bit because what he's talking about are things that make a, health, a church a healthy congregation. He says, I want you to be a good, healthy, spiritual tool in the hands of God, a church to have an impact upon their community. Here's what he says you got to do. You got to live in peace. And how do you do that? Well, you are not in the congregation. Here's how you do that. Here's how the church does it within their body. 
uh, of the believers. You admonish, uh, you, and he goes through this list. Now, if you count them, and you should, of the imperative, starting with live in peace, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You got seven things that he says will make your congregation stronger in their witness to one another and to the world and especially their community. The church, the, the community watches the church and the church should watch the church. The, the church takes care of the church and then is able to take care of the community. You know, bring them to Christ and then nurture them in the Lord and the such, such as that. So, like I said, over the next next couple, two or three weeks, we're going to do a, a mini-series. We're going to do a series in a series. We're going to do a mini-series on, here's the title of the mini-series, Live in Peace with One Another. And today we're going to do the first lesson on it. Now, what's of interest, if those who are in our congregation, when the COVID hit, when COVID hit us and, and shut us down, it takes us way back to March. I started a series with you, the con my congregation, on how to deal with that. I took it from John 14. Jesus at his last supper, as he was preparing his disciples for him to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world to be buried and raised from the dead on the third day. And they were really disturbed with that kind of talk. They were upset. They were sorrowful. So he opens chapter 14 in John 1, 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe in me. Okay? Down, and then he goes into a long discussion about, down in John 14, 27. He says, and let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. You haven't seen the last of me? See, they think they've seen the way he's talking. It sounds like they're not going to see him anymore. They're not going to see him anymore. In verse 27, he says, and do not let your hearts become fearful. Now he says, what he said in verse 1, he says, he talks about it in verse 27. He comes back to that idea. And so I did a whole study to prepare the congregation for the COVID-19, let not your hearts be troubled. And in that, we discussed, you must learn to live in peace, inner peace. You've got to learn. You can't let the things outside your life upset you and disturb you and take your witness for Christ away. You, you've got to be solid and firm in, in what you believe. You've got to be that... You've got to be that lighthouse in the midst of a storm for others to find guidance out of the storm. And so we dealt with that. Now we're going to deal with another subject with similar ideas and that how do, how do, how do we maintain a good, healthy church? What, what is it that we do with inside the body of Christ what are some of the things that we can do when we have conflict to resolve it and bring us back into a better place in, in our body of Christ? And so th this is what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I'll get in our morning study, and I'll show you why this is be important to us. Remember that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do I get out of carnality back to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that entered my life the moment I believed that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead? At that point, the Holy Spirit took up residence in my body, and my body became the sacred temple of God on earth. A mobile unit like the tabernacle was. How do I get back 
to living my life for Jesus Christ so that it reflects him to other people. Because other people would be, listen, people in darkness are attracted to light, it, especially when they're tired of darkness. They become tired of darkness when they realize they don't have to live in it any longer because they thought it was just a normal way of life. I know I did. So we confess our sins. First John 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sin, which the carnality part, personal sin, carnality, if I confess my personal sin that got me into carnality, he will forgive me and cleanse me, restore me to the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's necessary in John 15, 26, 27, because the Holy Spirit wants to teach you the Bible, put it in your soul so that you can recall it in times of need, not just for yourself, but for other people. So let's have, let's have that private prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed to offer you the privacy of your priesthood to confess sin, to seek in your heart prayer that God would teach you something today that would stabilize your life in a, in a troubled world and give you the confidence of your relationship with God to walk it out to other people's lives. We thank you today, Father, for these that have come our way to study with us. Live in peace with one another. Well, of course, living is in our life. Peace with others, that's how, how, how we relate. We have to learn to live in peace with you, Father, in order to be able to live with peace with others. It shouldn't be dependent on them to live with peace with us. It should be on us to live with peace with them. I pray, Father, you would teach us this principle over the next couple of weeks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a look at this thing. I'll tell you one of the most interesting things. I've already covered point one. That was my introduction. I'll tell you what I, I learned at, at, at camp this week out of Cook Springs. It was really a good camp. It was a small camp, but it was a necessary camp. What I found out at camp universally, both by the young men and women who came to be trained to serve in ministry, we call it leadership staff now, as well as the little campers from the third grade to the eighth grade, is they were filled with anxiety. They were filled, and I'm talking about capacity, filled with depression, a sense of isolation and separation. I mean, they were a mess. They may look like kids on the outside, but they were a mess on the inside. Here's the wonderful thing. You probably don't realize when you support camp what a magnificent thing it is, especially in a time of COVID or, or really troubled issues in families. Here's what probably you don't realize that I got to remind you of and why camp is so, is so important and why you should support it every year. We send kids to camp who can't afford it because we, we spend all year saving our money to send kids to camp. Now, I'm going to tell you why. We take a kid and we spend 120 hours with him. Think about that. We eat with him. We play with him. We cry with him. We worship with him. We sleep with him. We get up and start it again the next day. Out of that 120 hours that we have these kids with us every day, with every opportunity that God could possibly give, counselors and people who come to camp prepared to have ministry with children. There are more opportunities during that day than you could possibly imagine because we have 120 hours with them. And somebody who comes to camp to have a great ministry with children wants more. When the 120 hours are over, they realize they needed more to really help kids 
get stable, especially this year with COVID. <clears throat> now listen to me. I've been a camper since the day I got saved. I've been involved with camps. That's a long time. It takes 72 hours with a kid day in and day out. It takes 72 hours to detox him from worldly thinking. You isolate that kid for three days and pour the love of God out of your soul into that kid. And it takes 72 hours to detox him from worldly thinking. Whatever he walked into camp with, that was just tearing his little soul up. And from that point on, you've got great ministry. And we had great ministry. This year, it took every bit of 72 hours. It took our counselors every day working with kids who were really struggling, both on a senior level of camp as well as on a junior level of camp. And we could have used for sure another three days for sure. We were just getting in stride when we had to send them home. Normally, we've got a kid there under normal conditions by, by Saturday and when he leaves camp, we've got him there. This year, we didn't have him there where they ought to be. We need a couple more days for sure because of COVID. COVID just really went. You probably don't realize how, how it affected little children's life. This year, we were able to go out there and stabilize these little kids the best we knew how. We poured more prayer into those little kids. We prayed more. We put more Bible doctrine in them than you could possibly imagine. But these kids need to be hugged every day. They need to be loved on every day. And, and I was working with the senior level, the, the teenagers, the high school and college kids. And they were in the same mass. I had to love on them every day, Ed. Sit and talk with them, pray with them. Maybe many of you don't see all that, so I bring camp to you to try to tell you why camp is so important for these kids this year more than ever. This year more than ever. And uh, I'm, we want to thank you. We want to thank you. I told uh, the consular staff that we would send, if they would send, bring a kid to camp, we would finance them. I went home and took my computer out to see what I had committed myself, and I thought, I just committed $3,600. Between now and next year, I've got to save $3,600 because I told the staff, you bring a kid to camp next year, and I'll pay it their way. What a joy that's going to be to see God raise that money for me to send a kid to camp. Eh? That's how invested I am in it. We had a wonderful camp. And kids got saved and baptized, and you can't. It doesn't get better than that, does it, Willie? Whew. So here we are, at point one. And if there was ever a year that we needed camp, it was this year. That's for sure. One of the things Jesus told us that really should work in our lives this year. And, and listen, you go out there. Listen, not only, listen, the parents got it too. The parents are loaded up with it. The message Jesus taught his disciple was to live in inner peace. Live in peace. That's inner peace. Listen, you can't live in peace if you don't have it in you. If you're in conflict and warfare, that's what you take to everybody. You look them at an eye and say, look, if you don't like it, let's step outside. Yeah, that's carrying warfare. No peace in that. The message he taught his disciples would live, live in peace. But peace has got to be in you to be given away. Peace should be in you and you should be giving it away. Like the love of God is in you, you should be giving it away. 
Jesus said to his disciple, peace I live with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Therefore, let, let not your hearts be troubled, nor let your hearts be fearful. Why? Because of his peace. His peace should take care of every warfare your life is in. Whatever conflict you're going through, if you're the cause of it, back it out. If you're the cause of it, back it out and get yourself right and get back into living in peace rather than conflict. John 14, 27. Listen, it's a grace principle. Your salvation is a grace principle. The angelic conflict is a grace principle. Romans 4, 4, and 5. It's not a work. If you get into works, you're always into warfare. How are you going to live in peace when you're at war with yourself as well as with other people? Romans 4, 4 and 5 says, it's not by works or wages, it's by grace. But how does the believer find the sustaining? How does he, how does he find it? How does the believer find the sustaining inner peace when the trouble lasts so long? This year, we've really been... God has really put the church, he's put the foot to the, the pedal this year, the gas, when we've been in this deal a long time. And, and, and listen, we've been in a world in the United States where the leadership doesn't understand any of this stuff and has shut us down. And they want to keep us shut down because they don't understand how to find peace in warfare. They don't know how to do it. Listen, and many of the churches are just willing to go along with all that. We all did in the beginning. How long is this going to last? Now they want, but listen, there are some who want to have it last forever. Can't do that. You got to live in peace. Freedom. Listen, R Romans 5, 1 and 13 says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Uh, people put you back into bondage. The believer must, must, must learn and then must sustain himself to live in peace when, the, when, when you're in trouble and it lasts so long. In this lesson and the lessons to come, we will tell you how to live in inner peace based on the Word of God. On the Word of God. Now listen, here's, here's some things you've got to learn. See, most of the time, we think, well, maybe I'm into something that's only for a short time, and I can, I can withstand a short time. That's a bad attitude. Don't go there. Don't go there. For example, if you have that attitude about your health, and all of a sudden you lose a leg, and you were depending on to live in peace so you could have your leg and you could get back to normal, and you lose your leg, if it was based on, if peace is based on your leg and you've lost it for life, you're in a lifetime mess, aren't you? Or suppose it's your mate. You lose your mate. Ah, worse than a limb, I can tell you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You lost her. You're not going to come back in time. My wife is not going to come back in time. Except for the rapture. I'll see her in the rapture, but that's it. Unless I go, I go to be with her. So how are you going to live with that? Who are you, are you going to blame people for that? What are you going to do with that? How are, you going to, how are you going to live in peace when you've lost something forever in the sense of time? How are you going to live with that? Well, we're going to tell you. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to tell you how to do this. Because, listen, the odds are you're not going to get out. We're under COVID. None of us, none of us were, had anything to do with COVID. It had everything to do with us. 
and then how it was dealt with. So, but how do you, listen, whether it was dealt with good or bad don't matter for me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to figure out how to live in peace the way the government says it one way or the other. If they're right, good. If they're wrong, they're wrong. Still good. I'm going to live at peace. Well, how can you do that in the midst of such a mess? It may be temporary, but it may be permanent. It should not matter to you whether it's a short term or a long term. You should be able to live in peace if it's one minute, one hour, one day, or one lifetime. You should be able to live in peace. That's what he's trying to tell his disciples, is it not? They've hung their head on him, and, and they realize he's talking about leaving and not coming back. He went like, no, you don't understand. I'm coming back, but it's going to be different. But you can live in peace. Let not your hearts be troubled. You can live in peace. That's what we're going to talk about, point number two. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, here's, here's for sure. Boy, you're going to say this is too simple, Ron. Listen, point number two says, God is 100% the source of inner peace. The peace I'm talking about, God is 100% responsible for it. I didn't say 99.9. .9, I said 100%. The peace I'm talking about is not what the world talks about. Jesus tried to tell his disciples that. I'm not talking about, listen, listen. he said, peace I, I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Therefore, let not your hearts be troubled and do not let your hearts be fearful. I talk about what the world offers you about peace. They don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. That's not the peace I'm talking about. I'm talking about the peace that passes all understanding. I'm talking about the peace of God that rules in your life forever, no matter what comes your way. You can have peace with God. And boy, I tell you, if there's one place you need to have peace with, it's with God. And his door is wide open. 100% peace. Listen to Hebrews 13, 20 on your paper. Now the God of peace, it's a title. The God of peace is a title that's extended to every person that will believe the gospel of Christ. Now the peace of God who brought up from the dead the shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, yes, Jesus our Lord. That's the word even. Yes, I'm talking about Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Should be. The God of peace has his door open for you to live in the peace of of God. You can't do it apart from Jesus Christ, but you can in him. It is through the blood of the covenant, the blood of the cross, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on that cross, that gives you the door because it was his blood that took away the enmity and the warfare and the hostility of the world against God from your life. And when he was raised from the dead, on the third day, he's going to give you that package in your soul because you believe he died, was buried, and raised. And in the raising of Jesus Christ, you receive this great package of who your identity is in Jesus Christ. He's peace, your peace. He's a son, you're a son. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's an heir, you're an heir. He's yada, yada. The list goes on. The package of salvation. These are things that you have in Christ 
that you can never lose in eternity and you can't earn them anyway except through the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He did all the work that you can receive the package of salvation by grace. By grace. You got to understand that the peace that we're talking about is 100% God. It is the peace of God who brought up the dead from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. Yes, Jesus our Lord. Here is Romans 5.10. Watch this important now. Therefore, having been justified by faith in the gospel, we have peace with God. Listen, God, his identity is peace. How do I get in God to get the peace? Because peace is in God. So how do I get into God in order to have God's peace? Only through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you want the peace of God, and you should, because the peace of God is greater than any conflict that your life could experience. God is greater than that. Would you not agree that God is greater in every circumstance? God is greater than any circumstance in your life. Would you agree with that? My, 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 my. You kidding me? Therefore, the peace of God is greater than any conflict in your life ever. In fact, all the conflicts in your life, you could roll up into one big one, and it could roll it against you, and it would have no effect upon your life as far as peace. You have the peace of God. You have it through Jesus Christ. And you always have it. God opens his door to you through Jesus Christ. When you step through the gospel of Jesus Christ into God, you're into God's peace, and that peace is yours. You will always have it with God because of the blood of Christ. Never be in your day that God doesn't look in you and see the blood of Christ covering the hostility of your life, and he sees it at peace. My, my. Peace with God, peace with God through Jesus Christ, peace with God. You got to get at peace with God to have the peace of God. You come to peace with God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died for your sins, buried, and raised from the dead. You don't get it through church. You don't get it through reading the Bible. You get it through salvation. Then it works the other way for you. That's, listen, the church is not the door. Not a door. Jesus is the way. He is the door. He is the way, the truth and life to God. Just because you join a church or get religion, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that it's not good. I'm just saying that's not, that's not why you get, that's not how you're going to find peace with God. You got to understand that. Peace with God through Jesus Christ is one of the nine factors in the 50 things you receive at salvation. If you don't have it, you ought to pick it up. You can go to our website, Doctrinal Studies, on the, on the front page. On the front page, it'll say 50 things. You click on that, and you can print it out. The only thing we say to you, don't sell it. We don't sell anything. We're, we, we don't merchandise the Word of God. This is absolutely free, but don't you take it from us and then sell it. One of the nine factors in there, with communion with God, which is part of the Eucharist, when you take part in the Eucharist, is communion. The blood of Christ brings you into communion with God. One of the nine factors is peace with God. If you, if you read that little pamphlet, you'll see that. You should read that pamphlet because it gives you nine things in the blood that are connected with the Eucharist with a cup. Look at I can teach you everything in one hour. But I can, I can give you tools and resources to carry you carry down the pike. Now listen to this. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we will get to it, not today. Now may the God of peace himself, the, now you don't have to say himself because he already said it. Now may the God of peace, when you say himself, he, he, he's making exclusive. God and God alone. 
Now may the God of peace, I already dealt with that. Now may the God of peace himself, here's his promise, sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body, that's the trichotomous tri man, be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call that the rapture for us. Look, look, look. I, it's okay. Look, I don't mind earning my my cup of coffee and a donut. I don't mind doing that. See the word himself? Because you didn't get it. Circle it. I want you to get that. See, you missed that. God alone. God alone. Not with your help, not with anybody else's help, but God alone. God, the God of peace himself. If you got that? <laughs> now, what, what, what has he promised you? Watch what he's promised you now because you missed it. He will sanctify you. He will set you aside unto holiness. He will sanctify you. He will set, set you apart unto his holiness. All of his holiness decreed. How much of you? All of you. All of you. Entirely. By that I mean your spirit, your body, and your soul. Who's going to sanctify you entirely? Uh, the God of what? Uh -huh. You got a peace. Does he, is, he, is, is he going to say, no, I'm, I'm going to have to need your help, Willie? Right? He didn't say that. Oh. Mm. No, no, not in this promise. This is a promise of the heart of God to you. I will sanctify you. I will set you apart under the decreed holiness of God entirely. <laughs> your spirit, your soul, and your body. That's, all, that's, that's every bit of you entirely. Now watch this. I will preserve you completely. Completely body, completely soul, completely spirit. Completely. Right? Is that what he said? This is what he said. Yeah, man. Without what? Blame. Because you know where all the blame is? On the cross. That's why God can be so liberal. He can treat you in freedom. It was for freedom and Christ sets you free and God is going to treat you with that. Without blame at the what? Coming of the Lord. You ought to take that home. This is one you ought to take home. Right there. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which is also discussed in Acts 10.30. You ought to take that home. How are you going to take that home? Huh? How are you going to take that home? You're going to commit it to your soul by the faith cycle. You're going to hear it. You're going to believe it. You're going to apply it, and God's going to complete it. That's the promise of God in it. You think God will do that? Based on what? Yeah, we're in the Word of God. At least Romans 4.21. At least. How come you didn't write that down? At least 421, what he's promised to what? Perform. Whatever God promised you, he will do it. Whatever God said, he, God will do. Romans 421, that's why. That's why. Point number three. Then we're going to take a break. There is no peace with God apart from faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There has to be Christ has got to die on that cross. 
He's got to be buried and raised from the dead to give you the package. If he is not raised from the dead, you don't have the package. You need to read 1 Corinthians 15. You need to read it seriously. You got to have that whole pack. Listen, to have the whole package, to get to 50, to get to 50 things. And that, listen, I stopped at 50. There's so much more than that. I just gave you enough to overwhelm you. You got to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to get the package. Because part of this great package is your identity in, in Christ. You're in God, in Christ. John 10, 28 through 30. One of the great illustrations of, of security of your salvation is that at the point of believing the gospel, you're in the hands of, of Christ, who is in the hands of God, and no man can get you out. No man's greater than the hands of God and Christ. Plus, he sticks the Holy Spirit in you forever, John 14, 16. They, therefore, you got the three hands. You got the Godhead who has secured your salvation the day you said, I believe that Christ died for my sins, were buried and raised. My, my, my. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now, isn't this interesting? You military men, you listen to me. Listen to me, military men. In the armor of God, in Romans, in, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, he t tells you to put on the full armor of God, military weapons, the whole military uniform. And listen, dressing has a code, a military code. Whether you're in warfare or in general inspection, there's, there's a military code of dressing. The Romans were every bit that military high unit, and they dressed under military code. When you read it, it tells you what he was commanded, how he was commanded to dress for combat. And they, they had a protocol, a dress code, of how to dress in preparation. Right? Now, here's what's interesting. Before they pick up their weapons to march forward to combat, they have completed their military code of dress. The next time you read it, read it that way because it's really interesting. The last thing that they put on in their military code of dress for combat, before they picked up their weapons, the shield and the sword was their shoes. I'll bet you the last thing you put on this morning was your shoes, right? You didn't put them on and then try to put your britches over them, did you? Now, maybe you girls could have done that, but... You know what the shoes were called? I wrote it down. I wrote it down for you. And having shod your feet. Now, the dress code is really important. These are not any shoes. These are military combat shoes. These are not the shoes you wear for general inspection. These are not the shoes you wear and wear out in daily routines. These are called shod your military feet with the shoes, shod your feet with the preparation, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Isn't that interesting? Because that's how you stand in combat is on your feet. And you are victorious when you look down and you see, I have the gospel of God's peace on my feet. Who? 
can defeat us. I go to combat, I go to warfare with the gospel of God's peace. I stand firm to fight the conflict before me, knowing that I have the peace of God. What am I fighting for? I look down at my feet and I see the gospel of God's peace. This is what I fight for. And I stand firm. I stand firm on my feet. And I look up from my feet and I see that I'm well equipped and prepared by God to fight the angelic conflict with victory. That's how David fought Goliath. With the confidence that the equipment that God has given me is sufficient to carry me to victory in Christ. It's a powerful idea, people. It's a powerful... And listen. Every day we go out and fight the angelic conflict. Sometimes we fight it inside, inside our soul. Like Peter, when Jesus tells him, tells the disciples, I've got to go away, and Peter goes like, no, 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 you're talking, you're talking death, man. You ain't even started the kingdom yet. I mean, what's the kingdom deal? You're talking about leaving and dying and all this stuff. You're, you're just getting everybody upset. You know, when Peter took Matthew 16, 21 through 23, when, when Peter took Jesus aside and said, you got to quit that. You're upsetting all the disciples. You got to quit doing that. You're talking about death and, and all of that, and, and it makes no sense to us. And Jesus said, listen, you're allowing the devil to disturb the plan of God that I've got to do whether you're going to do it or not. He looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. And you know what he said? He said, you're setting your interest on men rather than on God. Your interest is on man's interest and not on God's interest. I've got to stay focused because my interest needs to be on God's and not on man's. It's an inner war, wasn't it? I mean, that, that was a fight that was inside. This wasn't a fight on the outside. This was a fight that was inside the, the group. And it was spreading like wildfire because when time came for him to be hung on a cross, they were all gone except John. There were no, no other big disciples. None of the big boys were there. John. They, sometimes the fights we have to fight are in. They're really in close, and they're, sometimes they're in us. You want, the peace, you want the peace of God in your heart? You got to win it. You got to win that one. Listen, it's easy to win it. You win it by grace. You don't win it by works. Oh, what's wrong with me? You don't beat yourself up. You get back with a program. Confess your sin and get back like Peter did. You confess your sin and get back in it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is referred to the gospel of peace because it is the instrument of God's reconciliation and the removal of the sin barrier of Adam. 1 Peter 2.11, write it down. 1 Peter 2.11. You need to know the strategy of the devil against you. You, you need to know the devil has a strategy against you. It's warfare. We call it the angelic conflict. Now, he can't mess with you as a baby. You're off limits. But when you get into maturity, where you begin to become a beacon of hope in God to other people, when you begin to have a ministry out of your life, then the devil takes notice of you because you become a threat to his kingdom. You become a threat in his kingdom because his kingdom is always about bondage. You always know when the devil is in control of something, it always leads to bondage. And boy, we're in it in America. 
We're in it in divine institutions all over the place. But you always know when he's got his hands in something because it's always about bondage. He can't stand freedom. Therefore, he fights the gospel of Christ. He fights the Christians because they offer the world freedom from his bondage, right? Yeah. Romans 5, 1 and 13. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. The devil hates that because his whole system has to run on bondage. That's why he shuts down, locks up, pushes away. That's his method. That's bondage. So when, he, he, when you start living your life in freedom and go like, well, I don't care what that happens. God will take care of me. I don't care. God will take care of me based on what? Based on the word of God. See, the devil don't care if you study the Bible. He, 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 he cares if you know it and don't do it. See, he don't want you to know it. And if you do know it, he don't want you to do it. Well, have you ever read Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve? You see his strategy. He couldn't do anything about them not going to Bible study. He couldn't do anything once they were there to pay attention to what the Word of God said. But then he could toy with them on whether they believed it or not. Agreed? Oh, go back and read this. It's just a short little story. You can do it on the potty tonight. You know, it's not a big deal. It's just Genesis 3. Just read Genesis 3. It's just a little passage, seven verses, and you got it. But, you see, so what he's, what he, what he to, to, once, once we live, start living in freedom and joy and love and peace and patience and kindness, and we believe it. Then our life opens up. Other people want to know, oh, how do you do that? And then you share with them how you do it. Now you're a threat. So he goes, he has to go before the Lord and the council to get permission to test your faith. And the Lord allows him, based on the faith you have in your soul, that you can fight him and win. Oh, come on. Write this down. 1 John 5, 4. Write it down. Look, it's okay. Look. 1 John 5, 4. You know what it says? We sing this song all the time. We didn't sing it today. But we sing this song all the time. Faith, right? Faith is the what? Victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It's a great song. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's based on 1 John 5, 4. Okay? So he has to get permission once your life begins to be lived in the power of the Spirit and the power of faith, that attracts other people, and people want it. Now he goes, he goes before the divine council, and he goes like, look. I, I, I. And he goes like, okay, but you can only do this much. So he never allows them to go past what you have the faith to do. Well, just read that Job 1 and 2. It'll take you a little longer. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful passage about this. And so the, the Bible tells us that we need to be aware of the strategy of the devil. And I just explained some of it. I explained the bigger pictures of how to win the warfare. And so he begins to attack. Once that starts, he begins to attack the internal. He can only do what, and listen, God would never put him to do anything that you don't have the word of God. Listen, listen. Listen to me, Romans 10, 17, write that down. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And listen, what he knows that you should know is that faith is a victory that overcomes the world. 1 John 5, 19, the world is what he controls. 1 John 5, 19. But we're told in verse 4, we can beat him every time by faith. Faith is a victory. It overcomes the what? World. Okay? See, now, what you have to do is you need to know how to fight that warfare. There's two ways you fight this warfare. One is in the power of the Spirit, and the other is by the power of faith in the Word of God. Faith in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit and power of faith in the Word of God working in your life by faith. You got to learn that. If you, don't if you don't learn that, 
you are going to, you're going to be a miserable Christian. You are, because, listen, you're not a threat to anybody and not a blessing. Listen, when you're not a threat to the devil, you're not a blessing. Listen, when you're not a threat to him, you're not a blessing to God. You understand what I mean? In, in your productive life. Well, anyhow, here we are, Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You see, circle Galatians 5.16 as a key verse. And underneath that, now listen to me, write James 1, 14 and 15. Because he tells you how the flesh, if you walk in the flesh, how it results in personal sin. See, James 5.16 and 17, if you read James 1, 14 and 15, James explains how, when you walk in the flesh, how it produces personal sin, the mechanics. He explains mechanics. Oh, it's a great verse. You need to know how this, you need to know the strategy of the devil. All right? So if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's carnality. And carnality is personal sin. So what you have to do is you have to confess your sin in order to get back to spirituality. That you don't have to walk your way back. You can jump back. If you, James, if you read James 1 and 14, it's going to show you how you wind up in carnality and, and, and how carnality separates you from the dynamics of the life of God and the work of God and the will of God. He calls it, he calls it temporal death. You're, you're in a temporal death state in regard to what God is. Can, so you have to confess your sin to get back to spirituality. And you need to understand how the devil fights. You need to understand warfare. And listen, you got to walk into power. And listen, that's mental. What's the walk? Peripateo. That's mental. And let me tell you when it shows up in inner dialogue. In inner dialogue, something comes up, and, and you begin to look, look at that situation. You get to look at it, and you get to reason about it, and all of that. What you can't do is go to the flesh with that. that see, that's James 1, 14, 15. You can't go to the flesh with that. you got to go to the spirit with that, because these two are at war. The flesh versus the spirit, this Holy Spirit, are at war within you, over your desire, where you put your desire. Put it with the Holy Spirit because he desires to do the things of God. Don't put it with the flesh because it desires to do the things that aren't of God. So it boils down to you committing yourself to the indwelling Holy Spirit in inner dialogue. Go to the Spirit, don't go to the flesh. Because that's, listen, the Holy Spirit is a divine power over the flesh. Write this down, Romans 6, 12. Because you are going to really have to know this. Look, I can, I can look in your eyes and you're going like, ooh. Let me read 6, 12 to you. Because, listen, the devil is always about bondage. Listen, what he'd like to do is to get you into sin and to hold you in bondage through your guilt, through your not willing to get out of it. Maybe you're in it with another person. And the devil wants to hold you in bondage. His whole, de whole deal is to hold you in bondage. That's his operation. That's his MOS. Now listen to Romans 6.12. Therefore, do not let sin, that sin nature, reign, be a master over you, reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. What alternative do you have as a Christian church age believer? You have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, 
is the power over the lust of the flesh. The power over the lust of the flesh is the Holy Spirit. All of that has to be conquered in your mind where you live in inner dialogue. That's where you win it in inner dialogue. When the flesh is wooing you this way, you go to the Spirit of God who woos you towards God. The devil is wooing you away from God. The Spirit is wooing you towards God. You've got to learn how to walk in the Spirit in your daily life, in your mental life, in the way you talk, in the way you think, in the way you behave. See, that's the three categories of sin. You've got to learn to win this war. You win it in your head. You don't let your life go that way. You don't let your mind go that way, your thoughts go that way, or your strategy. First thing you know, you're... Your, your mind is going towards the lust of the flesh, and now you're developing a strategy within yourself that's going to wind up in sin. My, my, my. Where did that come from, devil? 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. How come? You got that written down? 1 Peter 2.11. Yeah, I told you write it down. You need to write this stuff down. Why? Because it's warfare. You need to read Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 6 and 7. The 14th chapter, verse 7. You should read the 15th chapter, verse 13. Listen to that, Romans 8, 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death. See, that's that temporal death that you get out there, and now you're into sin, and you're temporally dead. Temporally. How do I get out of that? Confess my sin. I get back. I get back into fellowship. I get back into the life of God business. I don't need to get saved again. I need to get back with God again. You see? For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. See, who, who, where's, where's the mind? It's in you. And you got to quit setting your mind on the flesh and start setting it on the spirit of the Holy Spirit where there's life and what? Life and what? Peace. In Galatians, the third, in the Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 22, 23, it talks about the fruit that comes from the life of walking in the spirit, the, the spiritual life. When you walk in the spirit, you get something good from it. You get the fruit, right? Nine fruit out from one tree that meets the needs in your life. You don't have to go to the world to meet these, get these needs. The world can't do that. The world can never satisfy. But listen, here's what God will give you. God will give you love, right? Joy. What? Love, joy, and peace. You go into the wrong place. When you go to the world, you're not going to get it. The world's a flesh, and what it is, listen, the devil understands that if he can get you there, he's got you. He's got dominance over you. Don't let the sin nature reign in your mortal body. Who do you think wants, wants that master over you? Now, the other key that you have to learn the other key you have to learn is to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you walk by faith, not by sight. See, both of them got an enemy within. Here's the enemy in walking in the spirit, flesh versus spirit. That's internal. Here it is, faith versus sight. Where does faith come from? In my mind, where does it come to? It comes from the word of God. It comes from the word of God by the Holy Spirit into my soul, into my mind operation, mind operation. You understand that? Now I can walk by faith. Faith starts by hearing, believing, and applying. Then God completes it. That's the faith cycle. That's how it works. 
You got to pay attention in class, then you got to pay attention after class how it works. In class, they tell you, this is how it works. Then God says, okay, show me how it works. Now that's a walking by it. You go to class, like today, it teaches you how the mechanics of how to live in the peace and life of God. You got to walk in the spirit, the power of the spirit over the flesh. But you see, you got to walk in the spirit to understand the power of the flesh. See, you lived your whole life always giving in to the flesh. You got to quit that. You got to change your mind. God says you got to change your mind. You can't do that anymore. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Well, I can't help myself. Sure you can. The Holy Spirit is there. Of course you can't help yourself. You're a bond slave. You're a bond slave to your sin nature. Of course you can't help yourself. What has God given you? What have I given you, son, to help you? I don't know. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, you gave me the Holy Spirit. Well, how come we're not using him? I didn't send him to be on furlough. I didn't send the Holy Spirit down to live in your life to be on vacation. What are you doing? Beast come down here. I want him active every day, every minute of every day. I want him active in your life. I'm just saying. Same with the Word of God. It, this is, it's one thing to carry the Bible. It's another thing to carry the Bible. Listen, what God wants you to do is to carry the Bible inside you. He's given you a phenomenal mind. Do you realize you could memorize everything God's ever taught you and it'd probably be 10% of your mind? If you, if, you, if you memorized the whole Bible and understood the whole Bible perfectly, it would only take up about 10% of your brain. That's how much God has given you. You go, well, I could never do that. I can't. I mean, I, I can't. Listen, you've ne Listen, it's not. You don't do it in the flesh. You do it in the power of the Spirit. How do you learn the Word of God? In the power of the Holy Spirit. You do, this, is, this is not like mathematics and history and geography and Latin and German, Spanish. This is the Word of God. If you've got enough sense to be saved... If you got enough intelligence to be saved, you got enough intelligence to learn all of the Bible and everything God wants to teach you, and even then it would only probably be about 10% of your brain <coughs> capacity. <laughs> it's a phenomenal. Listen, what God created in man is phenomenal. We haven't touched the surface in our life. We haven't touched the surface in our spiritual growth. In, in our spiritual growth of the Word of God. This is, this is a small part. When we get up there, we're going to look at God, who's got so much more than this book. He just gave us enough to use 10% of our brain. I don't know. Philippians, you circle that one. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I love this. Here's the verse you're going to need during COVID. You should circle it. You should learn it. If you want to have a ministry today, this is the verse of ministry. I saw that at camp this year. This is the verse for, for ministry during COVID. That's, I'm going to read it and then go home. I'm going to go home. It's time to go home. I'm not going to be able to get all that. My coat's sweating. Did your coat ever sweat? My coat's sweating. Now I know it's time to go home when my coat sweats. Listen to this. Listen to how he starts this verse out. Be anxious for nothing. You know what nothing is? There you go. Not one thing. Now, we got a lot of thought, things, and I hear people all the time, well, you don't know if you... Uh, uh, 
If you know my life and what's going on in my life, you'd have a lot of, Pastor, you'd be anxious by life. Yeah, right. We'll swap lives for a day and see. It don't matter. It don't matter what's going through your life. You can't compare your life to my life or my life to your life. That's not what he said. Be anxious for what? Did he say it to everybody? Did he say, well, look, if you're, if, if you're, uh, oh, listen, you're, oh, you could be excluded from this if you're, he didn't say it. He said it to everybody. He said it boldly to everybody. Be anxious for not one thing. Spent 120 hours with kids this week trying to convince them of that. You know why? Because God's in control, not the devil. When you're anxious about everything, guess who's in control? Is there freedom in that? Huh? You know, there's, there, I think I've been quoting Romans. I just was about to quote Romans 1, 5 again. You know, it's Galatians 5, 1 and 13. It was for freedom that Christ set us free in it. It's Galatians, ain't it? Yeah, it's Galatians. Have I been saying Romans? I feel like I have. I almost said it there. You know, Romans 5, 1 is pretty good, though. There's no condemnation. It's not bad. Well, here, be anxious for nothing. Well, what's this? But in everything. Nothing and everything are kind of exclusives, aren't they? Right? Nothing, not one thing, everything, everything. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. How should you pray? You know how you should start all your prayer life with thanksgiving. Spend the first time after you confess your sin. Spend time thanking God for what he already has given you. Then, then go to pray. And it'd be, you'd be surprised how your prayer changes. When you begin with thanking God for all the stuff he's already given you in your life that you, that you know was from, the, from God. You start with that and see how the rest of your prayer life goes. That's what he's talking about here. With thanksgiving, let your request, then let your request be, na- be known to God. You ought to put that in the proper order. And watch this. And the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Is that a wonderful promise? And every time I get confused about that in my life, I go back to, to Philippians 4, 6, and 9. I read it, and I go like, oh, yes, Father. Yes, 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 yes. Nothing and everything. Nothing is what the world offers you. Everything is what God offers you. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing. The devil promised he can't give it to you. Can't give you. When God promised, he'd give it to you. Devil can't promise you anything. Can well, I got to give my code a break. You can read the last part of that. It'd be well worth your time, of course. It was worth mine. Let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, Rick will take us out with a pledge of the flag. We still think the flag represents freedom. We think it represents the best of nations. We think it still represents America. We believe America is the land of the free. Don't let the devil take it back from us. Don't let the devil take it back from us. Think of all these people pouring into our nation today. They want the freedom to make a living, the freedom to marry who they want. To freedom. Hmm. God bless America. Listen, like all people, we've made our mistakes. As a nation, like a people, we've made our mistakes. But one thing about America is they've always been willing to work on them, to correct them. And we have a great constitution that brings us back to the equality of man. In God, we trust. Well, 
Let me have a word of prayer, and we're going to do the flag. Father, I'm so thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. I thank you for these that have come and visited with us in Bible study and taken notes and been good students of the Word of God. Those who come by the automobile and by the Internet. I pray, Father, we would take the concept of live in peace with one another over the next few weeks to heart in this church and carry it to those in the body of Christ outside our body for they need to know the truth. The truth sets them free. In Jesus' name, amen.